Julie Cole is the co-founder of the now multi-million dollar company, Mabel's Labels. Who here has used Mabel's Labels? Right? Yes. And one of her passions now is really helping other entrepreneurs, particularly female founded businesses, and whether that's mentorship or actually investing in the businesses. Please welcome Julie Cole. And mindset coach Hannah Khan. Welcome back. I make it part of my self image, and the more I rest, the more I make. Hannah Khan is an extraordinary woman. She has a very extraordinary understanding of how the mind functions. You know, when you started this company, Mabel's Labels, you saw a need in the marketplace, like a genuine need, but there was also another really personal reason for you. Can you share what that personal reason was? So um, knowing your why. So yes, the first why was there was a product missing from the market. Along with my co-founders, we were new moms and we were losing stuff all the time. And we thought there must be a way to use something other than, you know, masking tape and permanent marker. And there wasn't. So that was the first why. And then the second was um, at the time, my eldest child had just turned three and he received an autism diagnosis. And at the time, I'm, I'm a recovered lawyer. Um, recovery is going really well. <laughs> lawyer turned label maker. Um, who knows where life leads you. But at the time, yeah, so Mac got diagnosed. And I didn't think that the traditional workforce was going to suit me any longer. I needed a little bit more flexibility. And honestly, he had just turned three and he already had two younger siblings. I have six children. Um, so uh, I thought, you know what? I need to be able to advocate for this kid. I need to set up a great ABA program. Um, and I just, I need the flexibility. Um, uh, so I went to the girls and said, hey, you know, we talked about this company. Um, what do you think? And they were like, yeah, let's do this. And that's 21 years ago now. So I, w I will say, as Mabel's has grown and experienced a lot of success and a lot of challenges, like, you know, um, so is my son. He's now 24. And he's graduated from the University of Guelph. He's applied. He's going to grad school next year. He's traveled Australia on his own. He's a wonderful son, big brother, and friend to many. Um, he's got his driver's license, a black belt. He's a lifeguard. So uh, he's uh, experienced a lot of success as well. And I often joke that on my deathbed, I'll say he's my life's greatest achievement, and the other five are OK, too. <laughs> <laughs> well. If we can stay with your son, what's your son's name? McGinnis, Mac. Mac. Mm -hmm. If we could stay with that for a moment, there could be people that are listening right now that are receiving that diagnosis for their child, or they already have received it. What would you want to say to them? Do all the work. Do all the work now. While they're young, try to avoid sitting on waiting lists for speech, for OT, for ABA, for whatever. If you are sitting on a waiting list with your kiddo, you're wasting valuable early intervention time. Beg, borrow, steal, remortgage the house. Okay, you don't have to do that, but I personally would to get the early intervention because quite frankly, I wanted to be an empty nester at some point. I have six kids, but I do want them all gone. And I wanted Mac to be a taxpayer and I wanted him to live independently. So I did, we poured every resource. He was doing 40 hours a week of ABA um, and that might be excessive. And some people in the aut autism community might not agree with that. Um, that's what my advice is. And I think I've got a pretty good sample um, to say it's probably a great way to go. And you mentioned ABA. What is that? It's applied behavior analysis. So okay. it's it's a kind of therapy specific for kiddos um, with autism. Thank you. Okay. Now, many of us have heard, do not go into business with your friends and family. And you did both. <laughs> I did. You did both. Yeah. So what was that like? Okay, so the backstory there is my co-founders, one is my sister. And then we had these two friends from the University of Waterloo, Julie Ellis and Trisha Mummy. And um, they ended up marrying, Julie married my brother and then Mummy married my, I have a young uncle. So uh, that's what happens when you invite your like male relatives to Oktoberfest. They smooch your friends and get married to them. Yeah, that's right. So that's, <laughs> 
Prost. Um, so uh, that's, yeah, that's how that went down. And I'm going to say it was so, it was so much fun for a lot of reasons. In those early days, we were obsessed. We'd be at like our cousin's weddings and the four of us would be just sitting in the like, quarter talking about Mabel's labels and what we're planning next. Every family event, people joked because they would just find the four of us sitting talking business together. And they called all our spouses the Mabel widowers. <laughs> and like, um, So it, it was it was great it, having co-founders is wonderful because being an entrepreneur as a lot of you know can be very lonely and very isolating and that is one of the reasons uh entrepreneurs particularly deal with mental health issues and i actually just did a live with uh shula who's the entrepreneur's therapist um because the isolation the perfectionism kind of our personalities lend themselves to some stuff that can be pretty heavy so I think, especially in those days, the isolation would have been really heavy because this is 21 years ago. There was no Facebook group you could join. There's no podcast you can listen to. There's no, if you wanted to have a community, you had to go and like physically turn up at networking events. And you know, that was tough. We were making labels in a basement all night and, and raising kids. So, and some even had their day jobs still. So having each other was great because you know, there'd be those times where I'd be like, what are we doing? What were we thinking? We're making labels like we all left careers. Nah, what? And then in those moments, they'd be like, Jules, we got this. Don't worry about it. We got, look at, already people are talking about us. We see stuff out in the wild, our labels. And so whenever one of us was having a mini meltdown of like, what have I done? The others would be like, we got this. And also the support when somebody was having a baby or not feeling well or needing a mental health day we had each other to, to rally and do the work. And keep in mind too, it meant you had four different brains coming to the table, right? So you had like four different skill sets. Um, however, it wasn't without its challenges, right? Because you wanted to make sure that the, the workload was kind of divided equally. You know, we could ebb and flow with that. We wanted to make sure people were aligned to doing what they were good at. We wanted to be accountable to each other without micromanaging each other. We had to be able to have feisty conversation at the boardroom table and then walk out and say, hey, are you bringing the spuds on Sunday for Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, 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 no problem. We had to be able to leave that stuff on the, at the door. And we also really had to learn how to communicate with each other because we have four different communication styles. So that was challenging as well. There was lots of learning and lots of practicing. So some people that are listening to this or here in the audience might be considering going into partnership with one or a few other people. What would you say they must have in place from what you have learned? Okay, so um, know who you're getting into bed with. Okay, like know them so well. And I mean this in every, when, who you collaborate with, who your supplier is, but especially a co-founder. Um, but definitely you want to put a shareholders agreement in place as soon as you do your, as soon as you become a partnership or you get incorporated. Because if you think marital divorce is messy, you should try business partner divorce. <laughs> it can get ugly. So you want to make sure you put everything in place while everyone's still friends so that you're protected protecting yourself and each other. Okay, so get a shareholders agreement in place. What I think is very interesting is, as you said, you started the business in your basement, and then you moved it to another basement. So, so, so you had two basements that you started your business out of. Okay, so when we started the business, my sister lived in this like little house in Hamilton with this little tiny dingy basement. And it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was not the greatest workplace, but we didn't care. You know, I put the kids to bed at eight. Then I drive to my sister's house, work in the basement and make labels. And then we actually had, it's kind of funny. We, it was so hot down there and muggy that we had this basement door open that led to an alleyway and cats would wander in. And one person was in charge of shooing the alley cats out of the Mabel's Labels office. And also a fun fact, um, we're an e-commerce business, right? And in those days, you know, 21 years ago, people were still a little bit funny about putting the Visa card into the computer machine, right? Um, so we needed a website, but we didn't have a nerd among us, right? I was a lawyer, my sister was a teacher, Mumby was a graphics uh, manager, and Ellis was a um, financial planner. So good brains, but nobody in IT. But what we did have was our nerd friends from the University of Waterloo. And this is what I'm saying, like your network is your net worth. You know people who can help you. And we said to our these guys, we're like, we need you to build us a website. 
but we have no money. And they said, okay, um, you guys do have a foosball table, though. We're like, okay, you make, us a, you make us a website, and we'll give you the foosball table. And they did. So this multi-million dollar company is, was built on the back of a foosball table. So there we were in the one basement. We outgrew that. Well, what happened, too, was that we had a couple of employees at that point. We're like, this cannot be legal. Like, this cannot. This is not an environment. HR department. Oh, well, right? That's what eventually you're like, does anyone know anything about HR? That's why we always say you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because as soon as you think you know what you're doing, something changes. Like, you hire people and you don't know anything about that. Um, So... Rather than moving into a um, production facility at that point, we told my sister to buy a bigger house with a bigger basement, and she did. So we went to Aberdeen, her bigger house with a bigger basement. We thought we'd be there five years. We lasted two years, and then we moved to where we are now. It's had a few different iterations, but we moved there in 2007, and now it's a you know 20,000 square foot facility, and it holds our production. We still make our labels in house. It's our IT team, our customer service, our marketing, our everybody lives at um, at Mabel's HQ in Hamilton. Isn't that incredible? To 20,000 square foot facility. Here's what's interesting to me is that we're not talking about labels. Like you've created a brand and a movement that's beyond labels. Was that intentional? 100%. So of course our product is labels and our tagline is, you know, labels for the stuff kids lose. And that's what we want to do. We want to prevent things going in the lost and found. We want to make sure with COVID, it was a big shift to avoid germy mix-ups. You know, we got, we we're like, Ooh, new marketing opportunity. Nobody wants their kids drinking somebody else's sippy cup. Um, so, um, Wait, oh yeah, but are in the background, really, we're always thinking, are we making parents' lives easier? So we create content. We Everything we put out there, every product, we listen to our, our customer experience team is unbelievable. Like, this is what we care most about. And that was the thing. Like, honestly, we know our market and we know how moms are. And moms, we talk about products we love and hate like it's our full-time job right so when mabel's label started we our word of mom was only the side of the soccer field or the nursery school drop-off or the dance studio or whatever but then when social media hit we're like whoa hold on a second this is bringing word of mouth online and you know who's owning facebook and the mommy blogs yep the moms and we also know that our market doesn't want to buy from nameless, faceless brands. They want to buy from people they feel connected to. So very early on, about 18 years ago, I started blogging. I didn't blog about labels. I blogged about, you know, being a mom of six kids, trying to run a business, being an autism mom, being a big uh, mom of a big family, um, you know, and they've all watched my kids kind of grow up. And, and that's who moms want to buy from so have, creating that community and being visible i tell you your personal brand is so important personal brands are not just for like steve jobs and oprah they are for you because you know if you are showing up and showing your face then that builds credibility and then when you have credibility of loyalty you have loyalty you have customers who keep on coming back i think that's so important for everybody to hear because it's beyond whatever the product or the service is, and that goes to the why. I just think it's amazing that you tapped into that. We're all four of you on board that this is a movement that we're doing about how to make parents' lives easier, and this is a vehicle. Absolutely, and you know, Mumby, who's one of our partners, was very early adopter. She's like, we got to jump on this. This is going to be word of mouth, and so we did. I remember saying, you need to start blogging. I'm like, got it, got it. I'll start blogging because again, our customers also want to buy from moms who are trying to get through the day without smelling like baby vomit. They wanna buy from people who are like them, right? So we did create that community. So we had, you know, we have like 200,000 Facebook fans, but now of course, this is another thing as we grow and evolve. Sure, all, we had this amazing Facebook um, presence, but all the moms that we started with are my age, I'm 52 moms aren't now we're buying for our parents who are in residential going into residential care or whatever so we need to go you need to go where your audience is so then okay where are our millennial moms are on instagram they're on tiktok you go to where they are so that they can buy from you and it's okay for your brand to evolve and change you just i think have to be very transparent about it i'm not writing about push, pushing a triple stroller around anymore you know now i'm coming from like the seasoned mom perspective i got my 
my kids four and five going off to university next year. Like these are the things I I talk about. And then we let other people within the Mabel company talk about the diaper blowouts and such. So what do you think, where do you think the business would be, the diaper blowouts, where do you think the business would be had you not had you not seen that vision to say, wait, this is more than labels. Mm -hmm. We're creating this movement. Do you think there still would be Mabel's labels? Would it be small? I, what I what probably, do you think would happen? It, it probably, we wouldn't have experienced the growth we do because what we also learned in those early days was like people were only listening to, they weren't listening to advertising anymore. In the old days, we could put a, we could put a, an ad in like today's parent and be like, oh, we better all be at the office because we're gonna get tons and tons of, of hits. Not so much, but if like Daily Candy Kids out of LA posted something on their website about us, look out because the moms trusted Daily Candy Kids. If a blogger wrote about, oh my gosh, I just discovered this great product. They sent me these for my kid who's starting kindergarten. We're going to do a giveaway. Then all those tr people who trust that blogger now trust us. So that was a really strategic part of our growth. The other thing too was when you're starting out, we couldn't afford ads in today's parent. You know what we could afford to do? Connect with people on Twitter. It leveled the playing ground for sure. Like I can remember somebody was coming in from New York to do some like Barbie event. This is probably 18, 16, 17 years ago. And um, she was coming in and I saw her tweet and I, you know, I tweeted her back and I'm like, oh, I'd love to take you for a coffee when you're in Toronto. We're in Toronto, you know? And she's like, oh, look, I have no time, but I just looked you up. You're that crazy lady with all those kids and, <laughs> and, and you have that label company. I need to know more about this. So then I'm like, sure. So I send her some info and then she profiled me on her giant site in New York that had like 100,000 followers. So suddenly now from one tweet that didn't cost me a cent, it made it very affordable for young, you know, young entrepreneurs. Social media you're really leveled that. So what would you say to people? There could be some that are in this audience right now, for sure that are listening, that are intimidated by social media. For sure. I get it. Um, so I would say you don't have to go and do all the things. You know, do a little toe dipping. Say you're in a business similar to mine. Go and follow Mabel's Labels on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. Watch how we interact. And, and we might interact with people who might be potential clients of yours or customers of yours. So just creep for a while. Creep for a little while. Start liking a few things. Maybe then throw in a comment. Maybe reshare something. That's how you toe dip. But I would say at this point, find out where your people are and go to that platform first. But yeah, don't don't be so intimidated because you can just creep for a while and then wade in slowly. But I think you have to be there. Like to me, like there's conversations going on out there. You're either part of the conversation or you're not. It's going on without you. So get get in there. When you look back and had this idea for this Mabel Labels company, could you ever imagine that it would be a multi seven figure, like a multi million dollar company? Like you created with your partners, a multi million dollar company. Mm. When did you start to know that we got like there, people are paying. Yeah. This is we've got something here. So I, I think, you know, very nervous in those early days, for sure. I mean, not being able to sleep at night. I only slept five hours a night and not being able to fall asleep because you're thinking about Mabel's labels. But at the but really, we had some early indicators that the product made sense to people. Um, we had a couple of nice media hits. We did get the good word of mouth. Our first marketing camp campaign was us spending $100 on stamps and writing letters to our friends and family saying, buy our labels. So we had some good early indicators. We needed to uh, lease a a, um, a machine to help us with our labels. And I remember being like, oh boy, if we don't make this much, we're all going to have to pitch in. Again, it is helpful having four people because your risk is spread out. My financial risk, my emotional, my blood, sweat, and tears, we all were doing that, right? So that was, again, really helpful. But we never ended up having to pay the lease out of our own pocket on this equipment because we were, we were, you know, creating income. And it was, it was, it was, 
really like just one of those things that we felt early on like we think we are onto something because it just made sense to moms and we got great feedback. It doesn't mean you're not scared. It doesn't mean things go wrong. The other thing I think that we did really, really well on top of being fierce about our brand and protecting our brand and um, is that we, um, what was I going to say? That we did smart. I don't know. We did a lot of smart things. Where was I? The needed machine. Yeah, we needed the machine. The other thing, yeah, we didn't do also, and a lot of women when they're starting out, you know, you worry about where you're going to get your funding, where you're going to spend, like, get the money, whatever. And women typically just do, like, love money. Like, they might ask their parents or, like, they have a brother who might give them. Like, we basically dug down for, like, buttons and pocket lint. But, again, with the four of us, we could we could spread it out. Um, but it is so interesting how different women and men are. And we were asked to go on, like, Dragon's Den and things like that we're like well no because we don't want to give up any percentage of our company right already we only had 25 percent each so we just kind of like we're like we've got this and we were always able to fund our growth from what we made which was unusual it was unusual um and it it was cool well i think also what's interesting is that you've remained innovative in that space like again you would think labels is kind of this one and done, like you created it, and now that is it. But you have always been thinking, like, what is the next thing in this space? Yeah, yeah and I think that your innovation and your personal brand or your company's brand is what's going to set you apart from your competitors. Of course, other people have started label companies. Of course, there's competitors. I can promise you this. Whatever you start, somebody's going to rip you off. So you do want yeah. to protect yourself, your trademark, you know, no, no uh, passing off in the, in the uh, marketplace. There are things you can do legally, but at the end of the day, somebody's going to rip you off. So what's going to set you apart? We were a market leader. We were first to market. We, um, our, our connection, our listening to customers, our remaining innovative, being a fast follower is fine. It's totally legitimate business model. We will innovate a product, then six months later, somebody will roll it out. But that's not fun for us. We like being the innovators. We like being the ones who are bringing out the, the new product. So being fast followers, fine. But it is what separates you from your competitors is your innovation and, and that face and getting out there and being, being seen. Well, can anybody else think of another labels company? Yeah. Yeah. So some there's can. like honestly, but like, I can't. Like I just 50. think Mabel's labels, like yeah. Mabel's labels, is what comes to mind. I want it to be like Kleenex, like oh, yeah. you've got Mabel's. Yeah. I think it is like yeah. that. It is, yeah, it is, it, yeah. And that's it that's is. a testament yep. to it. Yep. So now you know you've grown. The partnership has grown. When was the partnership tested? The most would you say? Um, I'm going to say as we actually grew, I think we were all challenged when, um, when we first did our hires, we hired a lot of like people who can make labels, but our challenge was then when we had to hire managers and hand over some of the leadership, um, entrepreneurs can be a little bit control freaky. We're like, we've always done it our way. It's our company. You need to tell us exactly what you're doing. That's not good for retention. You need to like not micromanage people. You need to bring them in and let them um, use their expertise. Don't hire people who are going to stroke your ego, who are just mini use. Hire people that are smarter than you. Um, so I, I think we were all challenged when we got to that middle level. Uh, and I think as we had been together for so long, it got challenged as well because, you know, everybody's got different personalities and different leadership styles. And we were kind of running as like a four headed horse, right? As co CEOs. And it was a bit crowded. But that's why when we got, um, we were acquired about five years ago, we got a call out of the blue by Avery. And they said, look, we've been watching you guys and we'd love to take you for dinner and have a conversation. And we're like, well, we'll have a chat. We knew we needed to do something, whether it was like invest in growth or get one CEO. We had a few th ideas. Um, so we met with them and that was July. And actually it went so well. Um, the acquisition actually um, wrapped up at the end of December. So uh, now I'm the only partner remaining. Two initially went on to do other things. One stuck around to be the GM for a couple of years and they've moved on to other things too. Uh, so I'm still around, last man standing. Uh, but the reason the acquisition worked out so well was because they wanted the Mabel brand. They weren't coming in and trying to change that. We're still in our same facility. We're still Mabel's labels. It's still 
us. Um, and although Avery is uh, an American company, they're owned by CCL, which is a Canadian company. So that was wonderful as well. So it ha it worked. Oh, and the other important thing was the money. You have, you can't Can we talk about the, that? 100%. You can't be giving away your company's people. No, you got to get, you got to. So, and because there's four of us, we're only getting 25% each. The number had to be right. And keep in mind too, if anyone's thinking about an acquisition, you know, you you need to know how much your company's worth, right? So usually it's like EBITDA times six or whatever, or whatever the number is. And so that year though, for us at Mabel's, we were doing an investment year. So our EBITDA was low because we had spent $100,000 on a website. We had done a bunch of new hires. So then when they came back and made the offer, we we're like, that's not enough money, but let us tell you why, because you're going to be reaping the benefits of all our investing this year so when you if you are going to sell a couple things you should do is uh make sure your ebit is really strong so don't do an investment year do a big cash year make a lot of money so that it so that you get more for your company so an acquisition can be scary for employees of a company it can create uncertainty they wonder will things change dramatically will it be the same how did you manage that with the culture of the company so that was super tough. We are very transparent. We, you know, we created this company and this is one of the joys of being an entrepreneur. You can create the culture that you want. So it was very transparent. It wasn't very, it wasn't patriarchal. We weren't having people like you have to be in your seat from nine to five every day. It's like, just get your work done. Like, let us know you're getting your work done and we're good. Just productivity over presenteeism always. Um, so that felt really wrong because what happened was because the company that was acquiring us is a public company we couldn't tell them because it was insider trading so when they came in to do due diligence we pretended to our staff that we were having a tax audit which felt so gross to us because we were like lying i felt like i'd have a shower at the end of the day it was so gross but we couldn't legally we couldn't um, so what we did though was when we when the announcement was made and there was a press release we had a meeting with the staff and it was a mandatory meeting which we never have a mandatory meeting again not part of our culture um, so the press re release was coming out like January whatever because it closed New Year's Eve and so we had everybody come in to the office while it got released and we actually had a coach come in and, and, and help us deliver the message. So basically, when you're telling your employees that the business has been sold, it's like telling your kids you're getting divorced. They're going to be like, how does this affect me? Are we going to move? Do I have to change schools? Do you like all that? So that's the thing, too. They're going to say, how does this affect me? And you have about 30 seconds to calm them. So we actually, the four of us, we sat down with a coach for a day and we curated a message and so we went in we delivered delivered the message we were as transparent as we could be at that time and a couple of things that we said if we don't know an answer we will find out and we will let you know as soon as possible we gave everybody like starbucks or tim hortons um, gift cards and said at any point all four of us are around you can grab one of us if you're scared and we'll go and we'll have a coffee and we will talk you off the ledge and explain anything that you're nervous about and the third thing is in times of change that's when we turn to each other and not on each other so you know we're going through this together and and it was you know it was amazing like everybody was great in fact one team member stood up and said i just need to say gals like you did it yeah you started it you built it you sold it this is and then they all started clapping so that was just a, a moment. And I actually was a little afraid of backlash. Like I thought there's gonna be some PR backlash. They're gonna be like, oh, those four moms in the hammer who started in the basement have sold out. And I got some coaching with the PR guy and it was just like, okay, let me create some messaging so that when nothing, nobody came at us at all. Everybody was just like, yes, you've done it. 14 years of label making and you're moving on and you're doing great things. And, and it, was, it was awesome because I was expecting the trolls and uh, no trolls came out. Well, first of all, I just love how you received support and help by engaging with a coach that could you. help you yeah. to deliver that message. Because what would have happened looking back if you did not get that kind of support? Well, you know, we would have, we we would have upset our entire team and like we love them and we care about them and 
you know, I think probably that's one of the biggest things. You know, we have 50 full-time employees. When you start making hires, that's when I felt very, like, we need to succeed here because people are, like, relying on us for J-O-Bs. Like, they are feeding their children and, and paying mortgages on these labels now. So we need to do the right thing by them. And because we, you know, we hire to our core values, we really feel close to our, our team and, um yeah, it would have been, and maybe we would have lost. We would have not had the retention that we had. I don't like to think what would have happened, but um, instead, because, and I do think, especially like for young entrepreneurs as well, like contractors are your best friends, right? Like if you, you don't maybe need a full-time HR person, but contract somebody out, you know, don't try and do your own taxes. Like that'll take you a week. It'll take an account in 20 minutes. Like get a contractor get a coach for even like that coach was specific for delivering that message we use different coaches for other things you know so just make sure that you are outsourcing some of the stuff so that you get it done right well on that note what was your first hire because i think the first one can be um a little challenging because you are used to doing it yourself and it's good enough what was your first hire so our first hire was actually an easy one because we had a uh, cousin you know, his it's all in the family. Honestly, clearly, honestly, any single people that you want, uh, seriously, someone want, might want to marry. Yeah, in. Exactly. Yeah. So my cousin was just she was younger than us. So we were, I don't know, like 30, 32, whatever. And then Melissa was a university student at Dalhousie and she was coming home for the summer. And we we're like, maybe we should get Melissa to like work for us this summer. Oh my gosh, it's so good we did because that phone started ringing off the hook. She, we taught her to make the label. She, like, we at the end of the summer, we're like, if we didn't hire Melissa, we would have been in big trouble. Um, keep in mind, like, we were making small humans and stuff at the time, right? Like, it was, it was busy, and kids are home from school in summer, and ah, it was, yeah, mayhem. So Melissa was a dead easy hire, a no brainer. She went back when she was going back to Dalhousie. Then we kind of got a cust I think it was a customer service rep. So somebody who could answer the phone. Um, and then also pack up like, you, you know what it's like when you have a small business, you have to be a generalist. You have to kind of, I even find now we do have a full-time HR person, but they have to be a generalist too. Cause sometimes they're doing a high level director hire. And sometimes they're like rolling on their sleeves and writing a policy or like they have to kind of be able to do all of the things. So especially in a small company, and I'm sure you know this of your team, like you said, um, I think it was Charmaine, does everything. Yes, that's what happens. You have that person who kind of just, you can rely on for everything. So I think in those early days, those first hires have to be very, um, yeah, very generalist uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and it's funny too, because some of our original um, uh, people are still with us and like they were in the basement, like one Janet in particular, She's still with us after, like, I don't know, she's been with us 19 years or something. She's been around forever. And uh, and then some of them, you know, as you grow, they're like, ah, it's not like it was in the basement. You know, We never see you for. We used to sit and make decisions sitting around couches with the person in production. And then suddenly they're like, you guys are in boardrooms all the time now. Or you guys are, and it's like, yeah, that's what growth is. And you know what? Different horses for different courses. Some horses are going to be perfect when you're a startup. Some horses, you know, then they you outgrow them or they outgrow you. It's okay to switch things up a bit based on the size of your business. They're going to have different skill sets that suit your business at different times. And sometimes we hold on to people for too long. Oh, man. Oh, I could tell stories. <laughs> In fact, I will. Okay. okay. So, yeah, once I, I uh, learning this lesson is so hard because, again, humans, right? Like, nobody likes to fire people. And if you sleep the night before you fire somebody, you are dead inside, right? You're not going to. So, I remember we had this one team member, and every time the four of us got together, we would talk about her pros and cons. And, pro and then finally, one of us was just like, do you know that we talk about her at every meeting? That collectively is like how much money in the room that we're spending talking about this person. We got to get them off the bus. And, you know, nobody wants to see their people, like their coworkers fired, but they kind of do want to see them gone. You know, if they're not pulling their weight or if they're not contributing, if they're a little bit toxic, then... 
Bye. You know, you're not doing anyone any favors. You're not doing the employee any favors either. And you know what? This isn't a volunteer job. This is like, we're, we need to make money. We need to, this is a business and other people rely on it too. So um, I think we also then learn the lesson around hiring to our core values. So now, you know, like we can teach anyone to make labels. Can we teach anyone to kind of be, be, think our way to be inclusive to be so we kind of try to weave those into the uh into the interview questions you know so that we make sure so if we 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 take our time with that process and that way they stick around our retention is incredible like it is incredible because it's a lot of money onboarding and if you have a revolving door it is costing you a ton and it's a pain you know when you train people and then they're gone ugh so gross so try and do the onboarding correctly at the beginning because it's going to save you time and it's going to save your culture well one of the things you did say was that if you micromanage people they won't stick around no and that's why like honestly not only will they not stick around they won't be entrepreneurial and like i find at mabel's labels the kind of people that we hire we give them time to play as well you know, they got to be in the sandbox. They've got to be creative. They've got to feel like they're innovating. They got to have skin in the game. So we have, you know, we have the thing, the profit share, you know, because and then everybody feels responsible. And and if we have a good sales year, then everybody's rewarded because then you got the person making the label saying, OK, let me just check the quality control here, because if I get if there's a customer complaint, they might tell a friend who will buy labels, then we won't make goal and then we won't get our, you know, so it makes everybody like be a little bit more accountable in their jobs. It makes them work together. Um, and again, the entrepreneurial thing, like I remember when COVID hit, that was tough. I mean, we all know this was tough. We lost a whole camp season, right? Like nobody's going to sleep away camp. So um, right away, our team like put together a team now and met right away and said, okay, what can we do? Well, we have label making equipment. We can make those big um, round circles that say stay six feet apart. Oh, we can do like we figured out what our equipment can do and we got innovative. We created masks. We didn't make them, but we worked with a company that does very high quality masks, cloth masks, and we did put our Mabel's Labels designs on them. And people, because we were a trusted brand. We're like, if Mabel's label sells uh, masks, these are gonna be good quality. And that's our secret sauce, right? Like the labels actually stick. Everything does what they say they're going to do. So then while all these other companies were scrambling, what are we gonna do for COVID? We're gonna shut down. Our team got innovative and started making different kinds of labels and partnering with that, that company to make us some customized masks and, and doing other actual metal, medical supplies we were doing as well. So that was a moment where I was just like, look at what we've got. Like, look at how innovative and entrepreneurial our team is. And that's what you get for not micromanaging and letting them play. Were you able to keep um, much of your team during that time? We did. We were able to keep wow. um, because this was actually another little fortunate thing that came out of the acquisition was that we were deemed, um, what do you call it when you, thank you, we were deemed an essential service because although we make personalized labels for kids, we fall under CCL, which makes medical labels. So I felt like we kind of got through a little loophole there. Um, because of that acquisition. So we were able to keep keep going. I mean, obviously we weren't having a stellar year. We lost our camp season, but interestingly enough, we found the next year it was like we had a double cohort. Mm -hmm. Back to school, we did double sales, we did. So that was a really pleasant surprise. We didn't really expect for that. Um, so that was that was great. I have a few more questions, but think of yours because we'll take a few questions that you can ask Julie directly. Julie, what is your favorite part of the business? Where do you lose time in? This stuff. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is awesome. Like I love, um, I love going and talking about Mabel's Labels. I love speaking to other entrepreneurs. I do a lot of media. I do a lot of public speaking. I'm uh, in uh, March, International Women's Day is always busy for me. I'm going to Timmins to speak at their chamber. I'm going to New York to speak at the Prego Expo. I love Timmins too. I, 
Oh, I know. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, and then I'm going to Palm Springs to speak at the Alt Summit. So I do a lot of, um, you know, traveling, speaking, media. Super fun. I love that stuff. I love spreading the Mabel word and just getting it, it out there. Another thing that I know that you are passionate about is investing in other businesses mm -hmm. and other entrepreneurs. When you're looking at a business to invest in, what do you look for? That it's women owned. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, there's a lot, like there's a lot of ways. Um, I also do more so of my investing is with more like giving circles. So it'll be like a collective will like invest in, um, in, in one particular company. And then we can kind of also mentor and do that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that I do with a lot of, um, uh, is my time. I, I'm a judge for the Women Entrepreneur of Canada Award. I'm a judge for YWCA Women of Distinction Award. I'm a, uh, for the Revolution Her Awards. I do a lot of awards judging through the years too. And I think that, you know, my um, time, treasures, and talent are all things that I like to, to, to give back to the community. And finally, what does success mean to you? You know, I think it's kind of like the Maya Angelou quote, like liking what you do and liking how you do it. Um, success to me, I, you know, really it's just what are you what are you creating that is helping other people that is involving other people how are you collaborating how am i raising my family do i have good humans i've got great humans that to me is you know my biggest success story i mean they're kids like any others you know but they're great they're very socially aware they're like we have wonderful conversations um i'm proud of you know caring the caring i do for my family um i'm a good neighbor just all that stuff you got to be really like well-rounded in, in your success and not think of it as as one, necessarily like one isolated thing thank you so much julie thank you we've got time for a few questions who has a question and they can come up to the mic. Ah, Victoria, can you come up to the mic over there? Thank you. Incredible. Thank you so much for coming and sharing so much insight today. I happen to be reading a book called Play Bigger. I don't know if you've read it. And it's all about category design. So Everything you're talking about is exactly all of my challenges, I would say, in my business. I own a beauty brand. And it sounds like you perfectly created your own category. I don't know if that was intentional or not. I know Hina was asking a few times right. to see. Okay. So, okay, go on. Well, the rest yeah. of my question okay. is, um, I would say that I know what problem I'm solving for people, I think, but I think that a lot of people don't understand that it is a problem. So the problem that I'm solving is that I believe people are perfect how they are. And I think the beauty industry is very, um, what's the word, predatory. Uh, they, they go into people's insecurities in order for you to keep buying more product. So my solution is the product really isn't, it's just simple and there's only one option, but it's really more about like that you are just already perfect the way you are. And so my question is, how do I put that out there? Like, like, yeah. Oh, I love the category question because it was a challenge for us. Because keep in mind when you're, and to your, your point is you're doing something that's different to everything else. There's a lot of noise here and you're going that way in that direction, right? So for us, like you said, there wasn't a category. So the problem when you are um, starting a company that doesn't actually kind of exist is that you have to educate the public that they need your product. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at first I remember doing my first Toronto baby show and all these dads coming up to me going, oh, I'll just print these off on my computer at home. I'm like, yeah, you go do that. Here's my, here's my card. Let me know how that goes for you. <laughs> and they can't, right? They can't. So, you know, we had to do that education around, no, you can't print off something that's microwave safe, that's dishwasher safe. You can't actually do this. And also it was like, we also need them to know that they need this product. You want this product for camp. You want this product for school, for daycare, for your teams, for all of that. Now, luckily it wasn't a tough sell in that because once people saw them, they're like, I need that. And this was the one thing I will say about competitors, as annoying as it was when we were, you know, ripped off a year later, 
the thing is with the more competitors out there, the more common labeling became, and then it was an actual mandatory product for everyone, right? So the whole category became a thing, which is good for business for us. So, you know, that was not a that was one of the bright sides of um, of competitors. So I think honestly for you, I would say, you know, you want to make your brand stand out and be different. You obviously have a different brand, but I'm going to go back to what I say about your personal brand. You are the one. It's your face. May nobody else at Mabel's Labels, nobody else could be the four moms and the hammer in the basement. Nobody else could be like, and this is the thing. People will try to be you and they can't. And the mamas, they can sniff out a fake. I remember one time I was, um, yeah, don't mess with the mamas. And they're my, they're my market. I remember one time I, um, I was doing a lot of blogging at the time, and there was this one person who was kind of blogging in a little bit of my voice. And I uh, kind of used, I have a few kind of Julie terms and whatever. Anyway, I had a few people reach out to me and be like, Julie, have you read this person's blog? It kind of sounds like you. And I was like, you know what? I didn't get my knickers in a knot about it because it's not sustainable. You know, nobody can be you. So she's trying to find her voice. Eventually she'll find her voice and it's not my voice. I think she probably stopped blogging not long after. But that's why I just, you don't worry. Nobody can be you. Nobody can be your product. So that's what's going to differentiate you from your, your competitors. You get out there and you talk about your product. You get in front of these people. You get on every podcast. You, you, you look at your marketing schedule and say, okay, what is this day? This day is you know, something awareness month. Okay, well, how does my product fit that? How can I turn this into a PR? How can I get on breakfast television and talk about, you know, how the beauty industry is 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 on International Women's Day, how the beauty industry is 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 duping us. They're duping us. How do you talk to people like, Take you know, <laughs> reach out to Birds Papaya and be like, you know what? You talk about how uh, diet culture is costing women a ton of mon money. I've got product, beauty product, doing the same thing. Let's do a collab. Mm -hmm. We have oh the same God. issue where people are making a lot of money off women and our insecurities. Let's do something together. And then, you know. Thank so you. those are thank you yeah. so much. So I will start a podcast. It will be called Strong and Wrong. Yes, <laughs> yes, you heard it here first. Can I just say I I Strong and Wrong. Strong and Wrong. <laughs> Julie, I love what you offered as a possibility to Victoria because um, I've got a thousand ideas. Like, she's got I, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Victoria, I think I mean didn't you all learn a lot about Victoria? In this, aren't you more invested in her and the brand now? I'm gonna go buy all her stuff. Oh, we, yeah, yeah. yeah, and you, and um, and even knowing how much she loves the science behind it and her story, that's what also differentiates you. Is you, as you had said, but sometimes I think we don't share those because it's second nature to us. Like. And, and who would really want to know? But it's fascinating. Your story is fascinating. And how much you love it. When I am around people that love what they do, I'm just like, I. it's contagious. And you want to be around it. And to understand that that it's this is not um, like you care. And it's the movement that's bigger than the labels. It's It's bigger than a serum. I love what you said, though. Like you think, oh, well, I'll post this, but nobody's going to care. They care. Yeah. Like they want to, I did one of those um, silly trends. I did the, um, I'm a mom of six kids. Of course I, right. you know, and of course I, one of the, I did six of them. Like I'm sitting on a bunch of like Costco stuff. Of course I shop at Costco. I'm a mom of six. Of course I have a drawer full of Babel's labels. I'm a mom of six. Of course I, you know, I did that whole thing. and call them by each other's name, even the dog's name. Like, and that was like, it was a way to interweave a little Mabel's labels. But even if I didn't, you know, that's what people, they want to peek into your life. They want to see who you are. They don't just want to hear about your your um, products. They want to know about you and the stuff that you're up to. And like that, that reel just like it got I'll t like uh, Modern Moms, mo Modern Mom Probs um, commented on it. She's got you know, 800,000 followers. Birds Papaya with 3 million followers commented on it. Like I had collectively probably like 10 million like, the reach. Yeah, the, the reach. 100%. Yeah. 
hundred percent. So those are the things, and it's easy, like to just watch what the trends are and hop on. Like I did the, um, I did one. It's kind of funny if you follow my Instagram. So you know, salt burn. Has anyone seen it yet? Yeah. Okay. I had a really really clean house last week because I was doing an interview with um actually Catherine Schwartz and Edgar Pratt. So we did it for my house. I didn't insta live on her channel, and uh, again, that's somebody with a million followers. Like right, like just. And how'd I get on? I was like, hey, you're a customer. Do we want to do we want to do something? She's like, we'd love to do something. Like, we always say at Mabel's Labels, no's are free. Ask. Somebody can say no. No's are free. Um, so I did the, uh, so my house is perfectly clean. So I did the salt and burn dance to murder on the dance floor, dancing around my clean house because it was clean. And people are loving it. So like, there's just funny things that you can hop on a trend and it's you know but it gives people a peek now they're like oh we've been inside julie's home you know yeah and people care about that they do they, they care do about that stuff we've got time for another question somebody yes shalini you can go up to the mic and while you do that i want also to bring something to your attention i want to acknowledge victoria and this is something that i see from people that are at the top of their, in the top of their industry, the top of their game. And I remember this, and some of you have heard me speak about this. I was with, um, on a call with Bob Proctor, who was one of my mentors, and he was with Price Pritchett, who wrote You Squared, a fantastic book. Bob is interviewing Price and taking notes. And I think you notice Victoria was the first speaker here, and her hand was the first one up. That is a quality and a characteristic of people who are really at the top. They're hungry. They're hungry. They're yeah. all, and they they know they can learn from everybody. And if they have an opportunity to ask a question, they're not going to be worried. Well, I don't want to bother it, or I've spoken, so I shouldn't. Many of you don't go up to people or ask questions because you have a voice keeping you small. Oh, don't. They're probably busy. I don't want to interrupt. So I just want to acknowledge you, Victoria, because in who you were being, you really showed people something that um, that they could see for themselves where they may not do that. So thank you for that. Another great thing about asking questions, and I'm telling you, this is what I do. If I'm at a conference and I'm in an audience and they have like an open like ask, I might ask, a even if I don't have a question, I might come up with a really good question that I know somebody else is sitting with, just so I can say, I'm Julie Cole from Mabel's Labels. That was a great <laughs> talk. Here's my question. After I don't like, I usually ask a question on the answer to. So, but that's a way you just are always promoting and women are terrible about self-promotion too. Yes. So you need to be always be like, yeah, yeah, Mabel's Labels. Like, you know, get in front of audiences. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Got it. <laughs> Victoria Radford, her Instagram is. I always love hearing you talk, Julie. I've had the pleasure a few times now. Now you had four women, and so you didn't take any funding or startup loans, you kind of did it. And women are really, really bad at asking to borrow money. So would you go back and do it again with like a loan or startup loan? Or for somebody who is struggling, would you say, just try it on with what you have? Or would you advocate maybe for asking for help? Well, you know what, it's, it's a great question. And the answer really is, it depends. So um, here's the thing, if we had, if we had say gotten $100,000 investment, maybe rather than making $200,000 a year, we would have started off making a million dollars a year. Sure, you don't own as much of your company, but if you're making more money, you're getting more money for having your company. So you gotta kind of run the numbers on that and what you think you can get back. We were a little caught up in women are like this about not wanting to give up a percentage of our company, right? Um, but sometimes in giving up a percentage of your company, you're gonna make a lot more money. And I'll tell you, I've got a lot of friends who have done Dragon's Den and got a deal. And they have said it's been useful, not just for the money, but the mentorship and bringing that business acumen when they, like, they're starting out. You know, you've got people who have raised millions and bazillions of dollars as entrepreneurs throughout, you know, 50, 60 years, and they're your mentor and they've got skin in the game. So they want to succeed. So that has always been, that's the other um, definite advantage of having investors. Thank you. Shalini, why don't you just say who you are exactly. and what you do? I just gave you this yes. advice. <laughs> I'm Shalini Darna. I'm a chartered professional accountant and I work with small businesses. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. 
<laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> I love you, Victoria. She'll do your taxes. <laughs> Don't do your taxes. Go to her. Yes, yes. That was one of the first. And I yeah. remember thinking, but they're not going to understand my system. Yeah, yeah As, yeah, as yeah. if I just have this really great. They understood the yeah, system. Yeah. And it was much better. I'm sure it was basic. <laughs> it, was, it was so basic. Receipts in a bag. Here's my system. Yeah. Uh, Julie, I want to thank you. I, I want to thank you for, um, for taking the time out of your day to be here and to just lead with service. That's the one thing that I really have noticed about you as well, is that you're somebody that leads with service and it's all about providing service in your conversations or whether you are investing in a company. And I appreciate you and I appreciate you being here. Thank Aww. you. Thank you for having me. And this audience has been fantastic. Thank you. Well, if you loved that episode, you know what to do. Download, rate, review, like, and most importantly, share. If somebody came to mind when you were listening to this, share it with them, and I'll see you here next time.